hello to everyone who's joining us today. I would like to introduce to you Dr. Eric Wolterstor, who is the founder and CEO of Sovereignty First. Eric, could you give us a brief orientation about what Sovereignty First does? Sure. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie, and thanks to Melissa and, and, the, and the folks at uh, Condé Trois uh, for, uh, for hosting us, setting this up. Um, and welcome to, um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of all the people who, have, uh, who are coming on and joining us right now. So I hope this is interesting and useful for you. So sure, I'm the founder and CEO of Sovereignty First, and we're a company that, that helps organizations solve big complex problems, because big complex problems can only be solved through uh, negotiations that are cooperative and collaborative action that crosses uh, sectors and borders and factions uh, and cultures. So um, we have found that these, these, the negotiations and the collaboration is effective when four conditions are in place. And these four conditions are inclusion. You, you, you have the people involved who can help something happen, who can stop something from happening. And then trust, they have to be able to trust each other enough to be able to get something done and then a common understanding if they need to basically, you know, we hear all the stuff in the news around fake news and different points of view. So we have to have a basic agreement on what's real before we can work together. And then engagement, people have to be engaged um, in, in the process or we can't get something done. So there are ways to measure and to build those four conditions. And that's what our firm does. We can either uh, build those conditions or teach people how to do it or build the conditions with them. So protocols for building those conditions, that's what we're about. All right, all right. So could you be more specific what you mean by big complex problems that you're trying to solve through this protocol that you're, you've introduced through Sovereignty First? Sure, so big complex problems are ones that there are so many actors involved that, that, that becomes unpredictable. Who can think about, um, you know, think, think about migrations or environmental problems or global warming or the stuff that's happening in the United States with the social protest right now. So those can all seem overwhelming, um, but we work on local solutions to those. So if, if somebody's gonna be working on environmental issues, well, there's environmental issues in your part of Canada, in, in, in my state of Colorado and every country in the world. So even though these are global problems, we work on them locally. At, at whatever whatever level we're capable of uh, rolling up our sleeves and getting something done. Right. So what you're saying is that it involves a wide variety of actors to participate um, in this protocol to make that change that we want to see in the world. And we yes. Can do that locally in our in our own yes. our own hometowns. Yeah. Awesome. Mm. Um. So how did you get started? doing this work like what is your story yes yeah, so my story my story is as in college and uh, <laughs> hanging out with three friends uh, all four of us were from the west texas desert and the four west texas boys and we were looking at two problems then this is around 1980 and we're looking at growing environmental problems um it's a long time ago 40 years ago growing environmental problems oh, and we were looking at the at the aftermath of the activism of the 60s and we're saying you know a lot was done but there's a, a long way to go with racism mm -hmm. so those were the two issues my friends and i were talking about in 1980 the environment and racism 40 years later what are we looking at today right oh my God. Um, so these are these are complex problems these are these are problems that are solved over lifetimes and so our question was, what can be done to help speed up how humanity can address these problems? And we left college and the four of us had, uh, th that was the, the sort of the challenge, our mission when we went out into the world. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of it. Um, and one of us went into academia and one of us uh, went, became, uh, worked in the attorney gen attorney's general office in the state of Texas. One of us went into spiritual practices and I just kept looking on a much more of a business sense. Um, what are tools that, that are very practical, that can scale, that people can earn a living using them? And that took me, that, that's, I started to get some answers around that in the mid nineties. And that's what I've been working on pretty much full time since. Oh my goodness. 
So, so after, after you made the decision, um, what steps came next to you? Well, the, yeah, the, the vision, as you put it, was in 1995. And that was um, some, I encountered some, some theory around how societies respond when they're threatened. So there's a big threat. And one of the things you get is society splits. So you get polarization. So we think about all the polarization that's happening you know, famously in the United States right now. So you get this kind of polarization that happens in response to big threats. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw how we could apply that to cooperation. And so I started doing psychotherapy work with families in crisis. And then I spun off that business and, and um, then started working with the businesses in crisis, uh, software um, companies, hospitals, uh, startups. And then that ended up in a large uh, uh, project in Indonesia that the Australians were, were, were working with the Indonesians on. And that led me to Washington, D.C., where I was asked to do some work around the, the reconstruction efforts with Iraq. Um, always working on the same, at a larger and larger scale, the same basic problems of how do you get distressed people to cooperate to solve these complex problems. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to elaborate a little more on that, the project that you, you were doing um, in Indonesia with uh, collaboration with the Australian government? Sure. Um, so the, the, the Australians basically, and this happens a lot in, in international projects, both in development and environmental problems, um, where you will get a wealthier, more educated, more powerful country will want to solve a problem in another country, and they'll apply a lot of money and a lot of brain power and a lot of goodwill mm -hmm. to trying to solve that problem. And they'll create a great plan and then go into the country and then um, it doesn't often usually work so well. Mm. Um, and, and, and why is that? Because when the United States wanted to uh, help rebuild Iraq, it was the same thing uh, in a certain way as it was happening when Australia was trying to help um, Indonesia protect its forest that you had uh, the United States like Australia, you had more expertise, more money, more power, great plans and going in and that didn't work out very well. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry, I think I've, 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 I'm answering a different question than the one that you asked. Which, <laughs> we'll back to the question you asked me. No, that's okay. No, that's really, that's really helpful. It sounds like uh, these plans can be all well and good, but if you are um, engaging with another society, helping them to rebuild, whether that's development, whether that's um, environmental issues, if there's no collaboration, then the, the plan is essentially doomed to fail in one way or another. If you're not engaging with the local population, if you're not, if you're not addressing um, the issue the way that they, they know best, Right. Correct. Right. And th there's different forms of, of power. So there's a power locals have is that they know mm -hmm. um, who knows what, how problems are connected with other problems. Um, uh, projects aren't effective unless the local population um, buys into them and champions them. At the same time, local populations haven't been able to solve these problems. We know that because the problems aren't solved but they cause a lot of problems for, for locals. So it takes a combination. And, and what I, one of the things that we found is that, is that if we say, well, everybody should cooperate and, and here are the people who should be at the table and we're using all of these should words, well, who's going to make that happen? There's always another power behind the curtain. There's a funder who's going to orchestrate this. There's a, you know, a military that's gonna ensure this happens. Well, with big problems, you can't have enough money to force it. You can't have enough political power to force it. You can't have enough good reputation to inspire it. You can't have enough research why people should just simply do it because it's the, um, because it's the, uh, the correct thing to do according to, to knowledge, right? According to science. None of those things work. They can't be forced. So what we do is we start in a very different way. We say... Um, we ask people who are involved with it, who else 
can block this from happening or his help is really required. And then all of these, we call them prime actors, these influential organizations, people, they start to name each other. And so they name themselves who needs to be included because those people are influential. So it's not about where we should include people because of such and such, it's we can't get the job done unless there are certain organizations, people included. And so we want those people to be included, period. Right, whether they're trying to help or hurt the solution or to the problem that you're trying to solve, is that right? Well, if you're trying to build a railroad and mm -hmm. I can just blow it up all the time and it costs me $10 to blow up the railroad and it costs you a million dollars to build it, mm -hmm. then I can, you know, I can blow up more real railroads faster than you can build them. Right. So even if you hate me, I need to be included. Right. Right. So what... It, what is my concern? Why do I keep blowing up the railroad? Right. Well, ask me. Exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. So was there anything um, that was similar in the problems that you encountered in Indonesia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria? And so I, wasn't, I didn't do any work with Afghanistan, but um, I did some work in, in Washington, D.C. with Stuart Bowen. He was a special inspector general, special inspector general for Iraq reconstruction. So he oversaw the $60 billion of U.S. money that went into trying to build Iraq. So it was a, a bunch of accountants on the ground, basically, seeing, um, seeing how the money was spent, right? Um, and it... And so that situation, and so I'm, I'm going to name some differences between what was happening in Iraq and what was happening in Indonesia so we can see how different they were, and then we can see what was in common under both, okay? okay. So in Iraq, you've got, you've got an Arab culture, you've got a, um, a civil war that, uh, civil war, not civil war, people can argue about was happening five and six. There's a lot of internal conflict mm -hmm. that in the aftermath of an invasion by the United States to, to get rid of Saddam Hussein, right, for this, this regime change. So you have a war-torn Arab country um, in, and with, with, the, with a sort of a half military takeover by the United States trying to transition to democracy in Iraq. That was kind of one situation there. In Indonesia, it's a very different situation. There's an island called Borneo um, which is which is right, which is uh, on the top big island on, on the top of the Indonesian uh, uh, archipelago, and it's uh, most of that island is Indonesian. The Indonesian part is called Kalimantan, and this is the oldest forest on the planet. It's a peak forest, so it has nine times the carbon concentration. If you're concerned about global warming, is held in peat. Um, and peat fires, when they get started, burn, and they never stop burning. I mean, you have to put them out. They'll just run like in coal seams. They'll just keep running and running and running. Um, and, and they have been degraded uh, on this. There are two giant peat domes on this island. They've been being uh, rapidly degraded since the 90s. Um, is that from, um, sorry, sorry is that from, um, you know, the, the um, usual culprits of climate change, like pollution, um, deforestation, or what causes these? Well, it, it started initially just with development. So the Dutch put some canals in there um, until they were, until the, the Indonesians, have, you know, very kindly and forcefully asked the Dutch to leave um, after their colonial presence there. Um, but the Dutch had put some canals that cut into the peat forest, but locals also lived with the peat forest. But then populations growing. So there's more locals, so there's more canals. Right. Um, and then Suharto, President Suharto in the 90s had what he called a megarize project. So he took the, the, the southern of the two peat domes and he basically raised the, the um, cut down uh, the forest on the, on the lower half of, of, of the lower peat dome, of the southern peat dome, to raise rice and shifted a whole lot of the Javanese population up into the island. So moving the population of one island onto another, um, which caused huge social problems and the rice didn't grow very well at all and it really damaged, badly damaged the peat dome. So um, development, right? Basically development and things associated with development. And the challenge of course is how to develop without destroying the environment. This, this is the challenge right there. And right now, 
uh, Indonesia is is in the is is looking at relocating the capital city Jakarta, which is sinking right now, um, and moving that up um, uh, around Palangkaraya up on the island of Borneo. Um, and so you'd have this, you'd be creating like a, like a Brasilia or a Washington D.C. or a Canberra, just just sticking a new uh, administrative capital center right on this island that's already got a highly stressed forest. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the usual culprits. It's the usual culprits are just everything associated with development and progress. Um, so then relating that back to Iraq, the situation, um, how, were, how is the situation similar or different? Right. So, the, right, so the people, the culture, people say, oh, it doesn't work because of the culture. Well, it's not the culture because Indonesian culture or cultures is quite different from Iraqi culture subcultures. And Indonesia is not just coming out of a massive war the same way that Iraq was. And the Australians were going in, not the United States. And it was an environmental pro project to, to save a forest rather than um, a, a stability and reconstruction project, right? So these, right. Are, these are gigantic ways that these things are different, right? Mm -hmm. What do they have in common though? What they have in common, and I'm gonna go right back to the four conditions, yeah. which is um, there was a lack of inclusion. So the, the Australians designed a project to, to help save the forest that could eventually move toward becoming a, uh, becoming a, uh, a profit center but businesses were not included in the planning or execution. Mm. Well, how's that going to work? Um, the, pro, the, the, the project was intensely political from the village level to the district level, to the provincial level, to the national level in Indonesia. Um, and yet th there was very, only at the very highest level were Indonesian uh, political actors included. And so the, 90% of the political actors in Indonesia that needed to be cutting the deals to actually make sure that this would happen were not included in the design or the execution of the project. So a lack of inclusion, right? Yeah. Same thing in Iraq. You had great, good and bad. You had a mixture of plans coming out of, out of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. but they tended not to include the local actors, and it was the Iraqis who were going to rebuild the society. The, the Americans couldn't rebuild Iraqi societies. Like, it's not going to happen. Iraqis have to rebuild Iraqi society. But if the Iraqis are not included, then how on earth can they build their society if they're not included in the design or the, or the implementation? So that's the first condition is inclusion, right? So the second one is trust. So I'll just give you one example of trust between the Australians and the Indonesians. Um, many, And I have to say, Everybody I worked on in Indonesia really liked each other and they were excited about the project and they were affectionate to me and toward each other. So this is, this is a tiny little thing that, that the Javanese are famously quiet and Australians are, you know, sort of, sort of famously, yeah, they talk a lot and they talk loud and they, and they speak aggressively, right? So you sit down to a meeting and, uh, you know, and the, the Australians are like, okay, let's get on it, yeah. right? And it's going. And the Javanese are going to wait and they're going to say, okay, this is their style and they're going to stop and they're going to wait for us and then we're going to talk and we're going to have a conversation. But that's not what would happen often. The Australians would just keep talking and every time they took a breath, the Javanese didn't step in. So they kept talking. You know, so they kept talking. So you had a lot of one way flow of information. Okay. In a very different way, you had the same exact dynamic where the Americans are coming in and there are military forces all around and there's huge amounts of money. So there's guns and money and Americans all around Iraq. Mm -hmm. And so what are the Iraqis gonna do? But they're going to listen first, right? We're gonna, we have to listen. These people could kill us. These people could make us rich. These people could be our worst nightmare. They could be the, 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 greatest, the greatest thing that ever happened to us. Um, so really gonna, they're going to be quiet and listen. Well, then they're listening, and what do the Americans do? Well, I guess they like what we're saying, so they're going to keep right on on going. So we get information flowing from the uh, from the Americans to the Iraqis, but almost no information coming back the other way. Mm -hmm. So 
What does this lead to? It leads to a lack of trust. How can the Australians and the Americans trust the Indonesians and the Iraqis if they won't say anything? Right. Yeah. How, how can the Indonesians and the Iraqis trust the Australians and the Americans if they never shut up and listen to us? Yeah. Right. So there's a lack of there's a lack of trust mm -hmm. around a whole lot of things. I'm just giving one example of it of a trust thread. Right. Um, could talk much more about that. You know, common understanding. Do they see each other? Do they see the situation in the same way? Well, dramatically, no, they don't at all. And what is the full engagement? You tended to get over-engaged Australians, over-engaged Americans, under-engaged Indonesians, under-engaged Iraqis, whereas it needed to be flipped. It needed to be the other way around. The, in, this is going to be an Indonesian project and an Iraqi project with technical support and funding and partnership from the Australians and the Americans, but that it ended up being really quite, quite the reverse of that. So in terms of these four conditions, the two situations were effectively identical. Right. Yeah. Um, so how did these experiences inform your method of solving these problems? Well, there are a lot of really skilled individuals who everything that I've just said, they're like, oh, obviously. And this is their specialty, working across particular cultures or working with uh, particular difficult situations. And that's what they do. So there's, I don't know, five or 10,000 people around the world who just go around solving problems like this. Mm -hmm. that, that approach, I didn't see as sufficient because we've got so many growing problems in the world that they're not gonna be solved by five or 10,000 experts going around and working informally and intuitively based on their personal skill sets and their life experience and integrity. It's wonderful that we have those five or 10,000 people and we need them. But the only way to solve this problem is that I see is for us to have transparent, measurable, repeatable protocols that can be tested and that anybody can learn. So you can get a well-intentioned, hardworking 30-year-old who can get most of the job done that one of these, these super experts can do um, and so we can have, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people just applying these tools and we get this magnified effect right. where we can get the problem solved without having to have these special experts. Um, and so this problem solving or the solution that you come up with is actually called the solution accelerator. Yeah. Um, now, how long have you been working on this for and what are the um, key working uh, components of the Solution Accelerator? So I've been working on what became the Solution Accelerator since 1995 and working out the protocols. So it so began to work out the protocols in, in, in family psychotherapy and then, and then in business turnarounds and businesses in crisis and then in international programs and then in, um, in societies. So each of those is very different. Um, people want things different. In a family in the crisis, they generally want everybody to get along. In a business, they want to be able to pay the bills. Um, you got to be, be able to do what you do and generate a profit. Um, in the international programs, you want to be able to get your mission accomplished and have good relationships. Um, right? And politically, you want to be able to have the, the society but thrive and develop um, when a whole bunch of problems are happening at the same time. So there's different needs. Money works differently in each. Power works differently in each. Um, different, different motivations. So spending the last 25 years working in each of these, testing these protocols so that they can work across all of those different uh, sectors and motivations and sizes. So that, that's what's been going on the whole time. That's why there's been a series of businesses and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Eric, um, I think it's time for you. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask our audience of viewers, I would. 
Awesome. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask you, you all some. I'm, I'm guessing that um, some of you uh, or most of you who are watching are, are engaged with different kinds of um, complex problems. And so I, I have a set of questions. So I'm just going to ask you five questions and then uh, answer any of the ones that you want and um, send in the answers. And uh, we can maybe begin to have kind of a conversation here. So what have you found is the hardest thing about this problem that you're trying to solve? That's the first question. Um, when was the last time you encountered this problem? I mean, like today, yesterday, five years ago. Um, why is this problem hard? What makes it difficult for you? Um, and what have you done or seen other people try to do to solve this problem? And then what's, what's not been satisfactory? What do you not love about the solutions that have been used so far? Those are my questions for you. And I'd love for this to be the beginning of a, of a conversation here. Yeah, absolutely. So for all our viewers, um, to post a comment, please go to the Facebook broadcast um, where you can respond to the questions and we can, uh, we can get started engaging in a discussion um, around complex problems. May I say something while you're sorting that? Absolutely. So... But the, the solution accelerator is, it's basically, it's these protocols for, for building these four conditions. And we can teach them to people through like an online training that your company is hosting or through workshops. We've got a, a free tool on our website that, that talks about the basic principles and how to apply them. Uh, we can come in through teleconference or in person um, to help start this process up or to do consulting work over time to kind of guide it. And we can go into a place and, and set up these, these, um, this whole process on the ground in various places and do it ourselves for you. Oh, here we go. <laughs> do you find that getting women involved in these discussions are more difficult than men when in environments such as Afghanistan. Now, I know that you mentioned um, that you didn't actually complete work in Afghanistan, uh, but you were, however, uh, working in Iraq. So I'll let you take the, uh, take the floor. Great, okay. So Mateen, thank you so much um, for writing in. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give an example from Indonesia, if that's okay. <clears throat> the, the question that kind of came up is, who that the, in the project there is who needs to be included in these discussions and why if the if what we were working on if the project is to work on um on on saving this forest on, on, on preserving this particular forest then what's important to say is what problems are interconnected with this problem now that the question about what problems are interconnected with this problem, the answer to this needs to be from people, the Indonesians, Indonesians in broader Indonesian society or Indonesians who are working, um, you know, working and living in the, in, on, on the island of Borneo in, in Kalimantan, right? Let's say my whole job is that my intent in life is to save this forest. And I really don't care about anything on the planet except for saving this forest. If I go, so I'm going to give an example right now of when it's critically important to make a point of including women and when it's completely irrelevant. So I'm going to, I'm going to give two different examples. In one example, um, in the first example, we go in um, to try to save the forest and we're talking with people and we find out that many of the decisions that are made about how the families choose whether or not to sell the lumber to a palm oil company, um, that those decisions are made by the women and the families. Then it becomes essential to bring women into this process because they're key decision makers in this. Um, and so then we've got to find out how do we engage with the women here? Great. So if somebody says, well, why are you working so hard to engage with women here? We can say, because women tend to make the main decisions around 
education for the children. If somebody says, so why are you trying to include women here? Why is this so important? It's because women will make these key decisions around the family economies, whether the children are going to school, whether they go to the hospital, whether we should sell off some of the land that's part of the, the family land or influence the village to, to give palm oil cup as part of the land. That, that means that we have to work with women in that case. That's very different from the question of when outsiders will say, yes, and we need to not only do the forest, but we need to include women at the same time. So part of what can make it difficult is if you get an outsider who says, this is my issue. So I'm gonna take your forestry issue and we're gonna add a women's empowerment issue at the same time. And then you will get outsiders muddling the waters and not helping things at all. So, so a, somebody that I, some Indonesians that I spoke with were really quite frustrated around this because they felt as if there were international agency people who were demanding that it wasn't enough to simply help the Indonesians cut the political deals and get, and get local engagement to solve the problems, but they had to do it according to the way that people in Brussels and the World Bank thought that that should happen. Mm -hmm. And that made them crazy. Um, yeah, so I think that you answered, I think you answered it perfectly. Um, so let's go back to um, the topic of climate change. So, you know, we, we see the marches going on, we know, we have an idea of what needs to be done. Um, there's uh, there's action taken by, you know, the national government. There's also provincial or state level, also at the local level. Um, but it seems like nothing, no real changes are being made. Um, so I think that that's probably one of the hardest parts um, that I find when talking about climate change is, you know, there's, there seems to be a lot of really well-intentioned people um, we can see the issues that are going on in the world um, that are making um, addressing issues like climate change um, more uh, difficult. Um, but yeah, so I how how could we apply this solution accelerator to an issue um, such as climate? Sure. Okay, so let's let's compare. Two, two small cities. We'll compare Boulder, Colorado, and then let's compare that with um, with El Paso, Texas, where I grew up. Where I grew up. Um, so in Boulder, there's been a, a lot of uh, a lot of effort in attempting to get uh, the city in control of its own electric grid. It wants to use smart grids. It wants to move the utility companies out and it wants to switch everything to, to, uh, to wind and solar for the grid. Okay, so an activist comes into Boulder and they say, I wanna work on this. And what they find is there's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of education, there aren't a lot of other big civic problems that seem as pressing. And so a coalition starts to build and the city has now been going back and forth through initiatives and, and figuring out how to take over control of its own, its, its own electric grid. So when this, when, this, um, when this issue came up, the other problems it was interconnected with were like, okay, we can, we can have this electric grid be our top problem. So that's great. Okay, so, so that's, that's, that's an example of working locally and it goes well. But let's say in El Paso, where I grew up, if somebody begins an initiative like that, then the response may be, wait a second, we have, we have huge problems with, um, with, with kids, with poverty, um, that we need to take care of first. We have issues with the, the local economy that we need to take care of First, we have, some we have some parts of infrastructure, physical infrastructure in the town we have to take care of first. And so in that case, the, the people who are the, um, the, the let's say, get, get, 
get get off the grid or run independent smart grid people with around uh, around power may have to say huh how can i work with these people how can i help you solve that problem maybe we can solve that problem in a way that helps me prop solve my problem a little bit so it looks very different so you can work on an issue like this locally at the level of the municipality of the city um and just know the nature of complex problems as they're tied in with other problems, right? Like the way that the uh, coronavirus is tied in with the economy. And right. so you help one, you hurt the other. So instead of trying to just drive through on your one issue, the idea is to engage and to find out what the other issues are and what the trade-offs are. Hmm. Did, did I address that at all? Yeah, no, that was, that was awesome. Just um, addressing how, um, you know, there's, we can take action at our local levels, um, but that uh, it will look different um, in different local settings. Um, and then also that many of these complex problems are interconnected, um, which means if you're addressing one, you're also um, by means of interconnection addressing right. another. Awesome. And some, somebody just wrote in here that, yeah, you know, one, one of the business issue is a for what I've learned through environmental research, uh, Sean writes, is that the biggest issue is often necessity for collective action between hundreds of countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's true. And if the question is, there's two different kind of questions there. One question is, you know, what what is what are very very important factors? Mm -hmm. what, what needs to be done? What kind of things need to be done to be able to solve this problem? Well, that's right. Um, and collective action among hundreds of countries is certainly one of them uh, uh, around all sorts of issues. And the second question to ask is of ourselves. What can I do with the field that I'm in and where I live? Which ones of these are most important? So if, you know, if, if it's time to, if it's time to, you know, clean up the house and, you know, and, and a five-year-old says, how can I help? It might be, well, you pick up all the socks and put them in the laundry basket. And somebody else is washing the dishes and, and doing all of the other more adult tasks. Right. And so we've got big tasks and little tasks. So the, some of us can work locally. Some of us can can work at the states and work at the national level. But we let's engage where we can help instead of sitting back and, and feeling overwhelmed by it because we can increase these conditions of, of these cooperative conditions of inclusion and trust and, and, and common understanding and engagement at any level. And that helps. It not only helps with what you're working with, but you're planting seeds and building capacities for the people you work with to work at other levels that maybe they're more connected with. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. All right, let's see if we've got any more questions. All right, so in regard to Black Lives Matter, what would be the first step for someone to take to become a better ally? So I'm gonna answer that through the lens of the four conditions. I'm gonna say, what would the solution accelerator say? Mm -hmm. The solution accelerator would say that we need to include everybody who can make a difference with this. So if we're looking just within the United States, that would mean include all residents, citizens and not. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of trust, how can trust be built? Um, so so we, we tend to take these ideas of things like inclusion, we break them into step-by-step -step protocols of who, how to figure out who needs to be included. And the same thing with trust. So when we look at trust, we are, we're asking ourselves, well, what does that actually mean to trust? Well, one of the things that brings trust together is a shared problem. So if, if, if you and I are, are um, and 16 other people are on a leaky canoe out in the, you know, a leaky boat out in, out in the middle of a lake, well, we're going to have to figure out how to work together so that we don't all drown. It really doesn't matter how much we like each other or don't like each other, we've been forced together to solve this problem together. So that, that, that's a first piece there is, is find out who actually perceives this as a problem. And then, and, and, and those people 
become allies because they must become allies because they see it as a problem. The second thing is predictability. The more we learn about each other, then the more we can predict each other's actions. The more we can predict each other's actions, the easier it is to collaborate. And then thirdly, getting to know each other so there's more familiarity. So that's the trust condition. That's what would happen with trust. Mm -hmm. So for somebody to become a better ally, what would they need to do? To say, oh, this is also my problem. Right. This isn't your problem. This is my problem and your problem. This is our problem, right? So that's that. the predictability, learning more about other people who we don't know much about. And then thirdly, just have more familiarity, create more connections, yeah? Mm -hmm. So then common understanding relates to this. How do other people see this situation? So then looking toward a shared, a common understanding of what's actually going on, which is the opposite of what happens with polarization, where I take a certain aspect of this and I say, and I repeat that over and over and someone else takes another aspect and maybe they're both true, but we've each taken a piece and exaggerated it, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea of a common understanding is, well, yeah, basically, basically this is the situation. And engagement, the fourth one is to say, why isn't someone engaged in, in this process? Why when there is a meeting does, if there's a meeting and a Black Lives Matter meeting and everybody who shows up to this particular meeting is white or everybody who shows up is black, then there's a question which is, wait a second, what, what's going on? Why are other people from this part of the community not engaged? And that requires going out and asking and saying, well, what's it, what would it take to become engaged? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this has to do with, a lot of this is common sense. I mean, what we, what we bring is no great insights with this work. There's no profound newness in this work. It's a way to make step-by-step -step things that when we're calm and generous and we think about we things, we say, well, of course, that's how we should do things. And this is, we simply bring step-by-step -step tools to give us the discipline to, to engage with things that way, that, that's, that's how the, through the lens of the tool, that's, that's what the answer would be. Mm. Um, all right, sorry, I'm just looking over at some more uh, answers that we have. All right, so we're gonna go back to environmental issues. Um, so Sean's writing some about power. So I'd like to, to speak to power more generally because it's not simply environmental issues. So Sean's talking about environmental issues and it's a huge, what you're talking about, it applies to things that are not, um, are, are, are not environmental issues. It applies to all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Here is how we approach power. Um, and there was a, a third, I read two of the ones that Sean posted, the third one came up, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, ab 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 absolutely. So one of the, um, okay, Sean brought up two different points. So I wanna, I wanna respond to a first point around inclusion and empowerment, and then something about influence and power, okay? Two, two, two different things. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's happened that we all see within the main, the, the mainstream media, so the New York Times and the Washington Post and the, the big television channels like you know ABC and CBS and Fox and, and NPR and these main outlets can no longer control news. Mm -hmm. So you've got all of these, these small organizations popping up and doing news accounts, right? So as I've been following stuff with the, the, uh, the coronavirus, I've learned about some organization called Axios. I have no idea who they are or what they are, but I just know that I get report, I get referred to a lot of articles that they're writing, summing up things around coronavirus. So they could have a two person staff in a garage that they simply sift and think through information, or they could have a staff of 200. I have no idea, mm -hmm. but they, they, they're talking through things, a lot of things in ways that make sense. So my point is, the, 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 big, the big giant dominant media outlets only control like, you know, most of the media environment. 
And there's a huge amount of action happening in that, that 10, 20%. And there's, and what's amazing is there's, you know, maybe two thirds of the population over age 40 doesn't even know what Reddit is. It's like, oh, there's an information platform. There's, like, there's a ton of stuff like that. So the point is, is the, the, it's the, the cat's out of the bag. People are gonna connect online and that can no longer be controlled. Mm -hmm. And that relates to agreements. And part of the point we try to make over and over with the solution accelerators, we don't have to wait for the government. The solution accelerator can go into a situation that throws a cloak over a situation mm -hmm. and it includes whoever can affect that agreement and that almost always the government's a player, but it's not controlled by the government. It's, it's the government is an actor in this. So in other words, you can go around and create structures that are bigger and more inclusive than the most powerful actors in the world. We can now do that online. Mm -hmm. Now, but we also have to deal with the most important actors. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we say, um, well, who needs to be included? That question is not an aspirational question. Who should we include because we should hear their voice? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a really good moral thing to say, but that's not what the Solution Accelerator is about at all. The Solution Accelerator says, who must be included because it can't succeed without them, um, whether they, their contribution is necessary or whether they can block it. So when we talk about inclusion in the Solution Accelerator, it is absolutely cold-bloodedly in terms of influence. It says that, that when the United States went into uh, Afghanistan and displaced the government and then had these, had these talks about how to reform Afghanistan to begin to build a democracy there, the Taliban were excluded from the negotiations because they're bad people. Mm -hmm. Fine. And it's 19 years later, 18 years later, and one of the great forces in Afghanistan is the Taliban, and there's and things have not stabilized in, in 18 years. But one of the reasons was is one of the main actors who could who could block the work was not included. Mm -hmm. So we include whoever can affect something whether whether we like the people or not. Mm -hmm. So polarization is, it weakens us. To create an agreement, we have to find ways, we have to find ways to cut deals, um, to come to agreements, to work together that include more and more of the organizations who are involved. Mm -hmm. And not to say, I'm just gonna do some of these and not those, because then we get sort of, stuck where we can't, it's like we want to lift the table and it's going to take 15 of us to lift the table. Mm -hmm. And I like my three friends and I don't like any of your people, but my four people can't lift the table and your four people can't lift the table. And so we just yell and throw food at each other and the table never gets moved. Yeah. yeah. Right. We have to work together to solve these with people we do not like who have interests that we don't like. Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. There's, yeah, there's that, 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 that the Taliban in Afghanistan. It's, when you say it, I've, of course it makes sense, you know. But I think that what we're taught so much of the time is um, not to concede with the enemy, not to negotiate with the so-called enemy. Um, but as you're saying, even the people whose views we may not share um, still have the capacity to either facilitate or block the action from um, from actually taking place. Um, so I think that that, thank you for, for sharing that. I think that's really, um, mm. really helpful for understanding the um, one key component of the Solution Accelerator, absolutely. Before we go to the next question, I, I just, I wanna repeat the main thing here, which is that the value of the accelerator is it has a, step, a set of step-by-step -step tools where anyone can do this and apply this in any situation. Mm -hmm. It's not that we have to sit back passively and wait for super smart experts to come in and do it or people with big money or big power. We can all take these protocols and simply start applying them at whatever level of influence and concern we have right now. So how would you 
um, how could that same situation um, of building complete inclusion be applied to the environmental issue where we have, um, like Sean mentioned, um, the, you know, one of the, the key actors or contributors to, um, to environmental degradation is, are these corporations, but then at times it gets put on to um, the individual, you know, at the, at the personal level, it's like, you have to make your own changes. But meanwhile, we don't see um, corporations who want to build pipelines. We don't see them kind of pulling their own weight. Um, so how could we, um, how could we apply that to issues such as environmental justice? So we're looking for leverage points all the time. Mm -hmm. And if we're sufficiently inclusive, we're here, we are in Boulder, Colorado, and a bunch of people get together and they say, you know, we should really work, uh, we need to work systemically on an environmental issue. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to run our own utilities because then we can control that as a community. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's a good or idea, a bad idea, I'm, I'm simply reporting something that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to do that, in order to have that, that, that self-governance, that sovereign control, say what we need to do is we're going to take control of it and we're going to push Excel, which is the energy company out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Excel says, hey, you know, this, this, is, this is a place, we make a profit, we run this, we don't want to give up this piece of business. Now, it's not like Excel has just said, well, okay, if that's what you want. There has been a fight that's been going on for the last five or 10 years um, with, with ballot initiatives and all sorts of things for the, for the city to rest back, to pull back um, its control of the utility. So it's not that these things are easy or they happen quickly. We say, where do we have the leverage on this? Um, what, what, can, what is ready to happen in this environment? And, um, you know, going, going, back to, going back to Kalimantan, going back to Borneo, people there may not say, let's take control of our own grid. That's, that's, a, that's something to mobilize around. They just may say, whatever, you know, I don't even know what you're talking about. But let's save this forest that people have talked about that's in our songs and it's in our history and it's in our myths and it's all around us and it, and it feeds us. And as, as um, uh, Anafi Gucciano, who I worked there with, said, you know, for people who live there, the forest, the forest is their mother, the forest is their father, the forest is life. They don't want to cut down the forest. And they're caught at these trade-offs between, do I send my kids to school? Do I send my kids to the hospital? Or do I protect the land that I'm on? Mm -hmm. So the motivation there is really clear. How can people develop their families, grow their families in a healthy way and protect the forest? So part of what I'm saying is, is we find in every locality, what do people care about? What's the next step that wants to happen for those people and an outsider can never know that mm -hmm. it's like if if you just began to tell me what i need to do in my personal life to improve my life it's like you you don't know me and if i did it with you it'd be equally absurd right. right right so what would have to happen is we would have to listen to each other for a long 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 time before mm -hmm. we could say you know it's probably not helpful to do this or you might want to try this so, and it goes back to the question before about how to be an ally with the, with the, with the BLM movement. It's, we, we can't work cooperatively unless we listen to each other until that listening leads to common understanding, until the listening leads to trust, and until everyone who's involved, um, who, who must be involved, must be in, in included and engaged, is included and engaged. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's working very slowly initially to find out what wants to happen next. And then there's going to be the collective force to win those battles. Mm -hmm. But the battles are going to be the battle that wants to happen in the system. I, I mean, among the population, among the people, mm -hmm. not, um, not necessarily the one I want to have happen next. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that COVID-19 will increase the urgency for environmental action? 
I, 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 you know, me personally, so I'm not answering from the point of view of the solution accelerator. Um, it certainly has brought up a, it's increased kind of a global consciousness, I think, when we look at how is it spreading all around the world. I, I think that it's done that well. Um, and it's given such a good example for everyone to look at in terms of a complex problem. Because we're looking at the trade-offs with the economy and then health. And these are the, these are, um, there are um, likewise that there are these trade-offs with the environment and development and the economy. And so we get a sense of the complexity of this. So I think in that sense, it's raising our awareness, as they would say back in the 60s and 70s, it's raising our consciousness around this. But so so we're, we're more experienced and sophisticated um, when we work with these problems. I'm hopeful about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do not know Timo Kivimaki's work. I'm going to write this name down. I will look it up. I'm going to make a note of this right now. Thank you. Timo Kivimaki. Thank you. <laughs> I'm making a note right now. And the next time we do one of these, we're going to do these regularly, I will know more about his work. Thank you. All right, let's look through for some more questions. I think we're I think we're wrapping up. That's not a question. That's for oh, you guys. Not a question. <laughs> so, um, so thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Dr. Wolfersdorf. Um, and to our audience, I just wanted to share that we are going to be offering um, Dr. Wolfersdorf's course, uh, the Solution Accelerator Part One, um, Building Complete Inclusion, on uh, Conduito's platform. Um, now, if you sign up before. Uh, July the 1st, we have a 20% off discount. Um, so we have the link in the comment section right there. Um, we are planning on doing more of these uh, live streams with Dr. Walter Storr um, as we learn more about the Solution Accelerator. Um, we discuss uh, sort of global issues and how we can um, address complex problems um, and find solutions to these issues. All right. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for everybody joining. Thank you to everyone joining us. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And um, I'm sure we'll see you all again soon. Bye for now.